Greetings from Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. I'm Marine Staff Sergeant Jeremy Vaught. In July 2010, Army General David Petraeus assumed command of the International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. With this new change came a renewed focus on waging a counterinsurgency fight, a plan that will bring together Afghan and coalition partners to bring security and stability to the people of Afghanistan. But what exactly makes up a counterinsurgency, and how are U.S. forces on the ground adopting its methods, tactics, and pillars to bring a bright future to a new country in an ancient land? AFN Afghanistan canvassed the country for the last six months, talking with service members on the ground who live and breathe coin every day, including the man entrusted by President Barack Obama to carry out the mission. Unforgiving terrain, rugged mountains with a diverse ethnic and cultural population. Afghanistan is a country rich with natural resources, proud people, and a history of conflict. We have enemy pinned down here in the south. They keep trying to fire to maneuver out, break. The 10-year Soviet occupation, Pakistan, terrorist elements, and a long-standing Taliban insurgency has created a dynamic of insecurity, instability in all levels of government, corruption, economic shortfalls, and more conflict. <laughs> Afghanistan presents a daunting task for those looking to bring security, governance, development, and economic independence. Since 2001, the United States and its coalition allies have established a forward presence in the country, charged with ridding terrorism and removing Taliban power and influence. United States and coalition forces in Afghanistan are in the midst of a fourth generation warfare mission, blending operational aspects such as pursuing extremists via lethal kinetic means and building security, development, and independence of the decisive terrain, the Afghan people. Who, uh, who is the elder of this village? The goal of COIN is the sustainable reduction of violence and establishment of normalty. This normalcy requires an Afghan organized and led face, one that U.S. forces build upon via mentorship and training daily. Well, we've seen progress in a number of different areas, although it has been hard fought. Uh, it has been uneven and there's no question that there needs to be more of it in various places around the country. Uh, certainly if you look at the Southwest Regional Command Southwest, uh, our Marines and British partners, uh, there's been a continued improvement in the security down there, but again the enemy is very much fighting back because we've taken away sanctuaries and safe havens. Push left, you see the broken down compound that's all the walls are smashed. Essentially, counterinsurgency is a fight to win hearts and minds. Winning the support of the Afghan people requires collateral trust and empowerment of the Afghan National Army and police. A trust earned by putting an Afghan face on the rebuilding of a nation. Counterinsurgency here for us, you know, we gotta we gotta bring the face of the government. You know, they need to know that they have their government here. That's the biggest thing we're trying to push on them. You know, getting out, getting the, not just the face of the government on this, but getting the ANA's and the AMP's face out on there. Because we can hand out supplies all day long to people, but it's just coming from the Americans. We need to show the local villagers out there that the ANA and that their government is doing this for them, not us. COIN provides a playbook for forces to secure and serve the populace, build partnerships, promote reintegration, restore governance and pursue the enemy relentlessly. The integration of COIN into a formidable fighting force highly skilled in kinetic operations wasn't an easy shift. It's really tough. I mean, we were really good with what we did and coming into the COIN operation, it's an entire new skill set that you have to learn. You know, none of us had ever really done a village engagement. None of us had ever worked toward a well project. Uh, none of us had ever worked toward getting really the Afghans to, you know, move and be able to operate on their own. So, and I think we're picking it up relatively fast. 
The shift from kinetic to coin-centric operations and the efforts to train, equip, and secure a wider role for the Afghan National Army marks tremendous shift in mission for ground forces. The focus has changed a lot. In the Kunar, it was mostly a kinetic operation. It was a lot of uh, finding enemy and destroying them. Come on, come on, come on! And the focus has changed a lot to the, uh, the coin operation. I mean, we're just trying to get these people to uh, start running their own government, trying to get the ANA to take a wider role in actually securing their own nation. The fight's changed a lot. With this change in focus, the adoption and application of coin, one thing remains unchanged. The desire by the Afghan people to rid their country of corruption, insurgents, and the Taliban. One of the things when we took over here in Tehrani, uh, the ANA first sergeant here was actually out of Firebase Vegas with us, and the first thing he told me was, I remember you. We were in a lot of firefights. I looked at him and I was just like, kind of do remember. He started talking about a bunch of firefights we were in together. He's like, I'm going to make sure I tell my men that there's a bunch of good fighters here that are going to want to go kill Taliban with us. Unity of effort and cooperation work hand in hand with turning the pillars of coin from words and guidance into reality. A reality that will bring independence and sustainable initiatives like security and governance to the Afghan people. That's what we like to hear. Counterinsurgency in Afghanistan involves seeking out those who threaten the population and eliminating them, targeting the entire network, not just individuals. <laughs> In Kandahar City, a traditional Taliban stronghold, the notion that ISAF forces are merely nation builders is being challenged with key security gains and damage to Taliban leaders and fighters. That's very important because it helps the overall campaign to establish a security bubble uh, around Kandahar City and again to take away areas that are of importance uh, to the Taliban. It's just mainly that you're laying the need for well-trained Afghan National Army and police forces to defend villages and provide security to the population is constant and with this comes the responsibility for mentoring and training. Staff Sergeant Eric Gallardo has served multiple tours in Afghanistan and has seen growth in Afghan forces leadership and the ability to become an essential element in local and regional security. And we need to get the casualty out of there. We'll set up now, this deployment, it seems like, you know, they can almost self-sustain themselves. You know, they got their Kandaks, they're calling their Kandak commanders, they got company commanders on the ground, they got PLs, you know, their PLs are teaching their guys classes on map reading and they're planning their own patrol, stuff I've never seen. You know, it was stuff that we were touching on our last couple months of the last deployment. You know, hey, we need to start get the ANA, you know, get the ANA to plan patrols, make them take lead. A lot of growth, a lot of leadership growth with the ANA. The progress of Afghan national forces can largely be attributed to the extensive training U.S. and coalition forces have provided. I think that's, that's very important, um, is we're starting to build trust and build partnership with the Afghan. Maybe you come to America. Maybe this will... It was an honor to work with him, really. Um, to see some of the best and brightest from Afghanistan and uh, you know, be chosen as someone who's going to represent the American face in this war. It was really an honor. These guys are absolute superstars from everything I can tell. Afghanistan's remote areas prove a logistical challenge for the security forces. Thus, the need for the Afghan Local Police Initiative, an armed community watch of sorts, uh, they're important because they are in locations where there's insufficient density of Afghan and ISAF forces. Uh, so these are essentially community watches, all volunteer, with AK-47s uh, under a Ministry of Interior chain of command. But we think these will complement in a very significant way uh, our operations in other areas uh, so that the insurgents can't go to these more remote locations and, and find sanctuary and safe haven when those are taken away from them in, in more populated areas. Key leader engagements give soldiers like these pathfinders an informal way to meet with village elders and concerned citizens and bring to light areas of progress and even grievances. Tell them the security comes from the AMP, but they can only secure the areas they know about. So you have to make sure you tell them if there's a problem in your village and they will do something and if they need help, I will help them. 
Our key leader engagements are probably one of the more important aspects of what we do. Uh, going after the enemy and getting them is very important, but the KLEs develop our uh, continuity with uh, every village, village leaders, and uh, without their support we can't make this happen. Afghans who talk to coalition forces anger the Taliban. Generally, uh, security issues means that after we leave a village, uh, one to two Taliban may come to the village and uh, harass the locals for talking to us. Uh, we hear it every, pretty much every village we go to. These meetings present an opportunity to spread word and champion the efforts and support needed to make each village a better place to live. Again, let's remember that it's about us helping our Afghan partners win hearts and minds. It's not necessarily about us winning. We'd love to win them as well. Everybody indeed would like to be loved, but what's really important is that they support their security forces, their local government, provincial and, and national governments, uh, because that's the key to sustainable progress over the long term. Do you think those people in the Shura responded well? U.S. Special Forces units are using the Village Stability Operations Program to live within the population and shut down insurgent and Taliban safe havens. The origins of uh, village stability really began in um, uh, the spring of 2009. Uh, discussions between Afghan government officials and uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces individuals, uh, planning then uh, that went into thinking about ways to better leverage local communities that were resisting. So um, by the end of 2009, there were uh, four sites uh, across Afghanistan. Um, today, there are about 30 sites, uh, and, and I, the expectation is to continue to grow. The growth really is a function of um, areas on the ground where communities are resisting the Taliban or other insurgent groups. Security reduces the will of the insurgency and promotes growth. Through training, mentoring, key leader engagements and living with the people, Afghan and coalition forces are bridging a gap and securing a future. The road to good governance, rule of law, and human rights for all Afghans is beset by challenges. Taliban influence, violence, corruption, and greed. But the will of the people, a promise for a new Afghanistan, is leading some to reintegrate with their fellow countrymen. Uh, we have certainly uh, taken significant numbers of uh, mid-level leaders and fighters uh, off the battlefield, killed or captured. There is the beginning of uh, reintegration of those Taliban members who appear to want to reconcile back into society. Still the early days, the formal program of the Afghan government is still being disseminated and, and the structure is being established to facilitate that. But you can see an appetite out there by some number of small elements that clearly want to lay down their weapons, are either tired of fighting or realize that maybe the prospect of reintegration is preferable to that of a life uh, on the run. A new structure, voices of the people, for the people. A momentum-based grassroots effort by which attention is placed on the self-interests and self-sufficiencies of the citizens, backed by a strong central government free of Taliban influence try to get momentum, uh, what's called a tip or a cascade, so that uh, a rising number of communities increasingly resist the Taliban, helping local communities do what most of them want to do anyway, and that is resist, and providing a backbone um, that if they need support, a quick reaction force, that there is a ready-made uh, Afghan government with help from uh, ISAF, uh, assistance to these local communities so that momentum begins to shift. And I think in some areas of Afghanistan, we're already seeing momentum in specific regions begin to shift. This shift can be attributed to the flow of information. The venue for this flow is often a shura, or a formal meeting between village elders, the community leadership, and U.S. and coalition forces. It's all about that village, that valley, uh, that community. And again, the only way to develop those relationships and to develop the understanding that is essential to conducting operations properly uh, is to invest in, in 
human contact and lots of time uh, with the elders, with the, uh, the technocrats of the area, the, the, with the, the local govern, government leaders, with the mullahs, with the businessmen and, and all the rest. Thank you, Hadafis. The International Security Assistance Force arm that is primarily investing in human contacts is its Provincial Reconstruction Teams, or PRTs. By building schools, repairing a mosque, providing medical aid and training, and building local capacity, PRTs have made great strides in helping build a new Afghanistan. You know, this infrastructure here is almost there. Uh, we just need to keep spreading that. You know, there's still a couple villages here and there that are on the fence to whether or not they're gonna, they're gonna lean towards the government or lean the other way. If we can just show them and get the a out there and you know, help them out with their, their agricultural needs or whatever they need, new schools, new mosques, refurbishment, if we can put that a a face on it, that's, that's how we're gonna win this counterinsurgency. Achieving support for the Afghan government requires the principles of the rule of law, integrity at all levels, and freedom from corruption. Afghan, U.S. and coalition forces enabled a fair election in September 2010, giving the people a chance to choose. From villages in remote southern Afghanistan to large cities, ballots were delivered and votes were cast. U.S. forces joined their coalition and Afghan partners in ensuring the safety of voting sites and ballot integrity with manpower and helicopters. According to General Petraeus, U.S. and coalition work in bringing accountable governance is just one endeavor that contributes to the team of teams at work to secure unity of effort with diplomatic, international civilian, and Afghan partners. And it's this unity of effort that will ensure a viable, long-term, sustainable government for the citizens of Afghanistan. Francis Bacon coined the phrase, knowledge is power. And some 400 years later, knowledge and information is seemingly available on demand from TV, the internet, radio, and print. Turning a counterinsurgency from words on paper to reality requires communication, a standard for accurate and timely information. Hundreds of U.S. military journalists in Afghanistan are charged with upholding this standard on a daily basis. The government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, or Jairo, These military journalists are not the only game in town. They're joined by legions of international reporters, bloggers, and TV personalities. General Rodriguez says we'll allow ISAF more flexibility over the... How does the military media combat the assumption that the reporting is one-sided? Consolidate again in the central Helmand River Valley. That's well, it's very important that we try to be, as we say, first with the truth, and that's our goal. Uh, I personally think that the vast majority of, of news organizations want to get it right. They want to have the proper facts, they want to have the proper context, and they want to draw the right characterizations uh, of all of that. Uh, and it's important that we contribute to that, that again, we, we try to help them by ourselves being uh, first, beating the bad guys to the headlines with the truth. Again, not, and not spinning either. You can't do that and retain your credibility, your integrity. Uh, and if you put lipstick on pigs, uh, you will be called out on it over time. Afghan, U.S., and coalition force failures are a staple of international news media. And the Taliban and insurgent forces are quick to report on events that could be of some advantage to their goals. And U.S. forces are okay with this. Well, you know, the best we can hope for is an accurate story that's in the proper context. And so it's critical that we, you know, engage as many of these outlets, you know, when a story comes out in order to get them the proper context. Uh, and talk with them. Yeah, you know, one of the things is we can't do is bury our head in the sand and say, well, it, it is what it is. Now you got to take the time, get out and engage. Because if you don't, you're not going to win if you don't engage. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to win every one of them. Uh, but you know, the, the main thing that we're not ha that you know the enemy doesn't have to tell the truth. And uh, you know, we want to be first with the truth, and uh, and we are the first with the truth. Remember, there still is a uh, there still is no doubt a uh, uh, insurgent presence. Presenting the facts timely, accurate information, good or bad, 
creates trust and transparency. If we build in one area, we're going to continue to clear in other areas as well. Over. Uh, General Mills, Tony Perry from the LA Times. Being first to factually report on an event enhances credibility and stops the spread of disinformation. Getting out the, the, the story first is key, and that is part of the battle, the battle of a big war. So as we, as the situation evolves, whether good or bad, whether coalition forces were, were engaged in contact and something may have happened on accident, we, will, we need to use the media to get that out front. The Afghan people and even the people of the United States trust the United States military because we are very clear, transparent to everyone, ensure that everyone knows the story, knows exactly what happened. The, uh, enabling the governance here with the Afghan governance. And, uh, Though the vast majority of news never makes it to the Afghan population, most Afghans don't own a TV, a computer, or even have electricity. But a good share have hand crank or battery powered radios. And with a 28% literacy rate, the airwaves and word of mouth are an essential means of passing information. So a lot of uh, people, they have one or two radios at their homes and they listen to it and it is very good for uh, sending our message to the people. This is very good tools for that. And people can, through our radio, find out the truth, what is going on. This Afghan goes by the nickname Khashal and asked to have his identity protected as speaking out against the Taliban and talking about a new independent Afghanistan can be dangerous for him and his family. But for Khashal, the duty to inform his fellow Afghans is worth the risk. But we see that in a lot of roadside bombs, IEDs, uh, innocent people are killed, children, women are killed, and the uh, have no respect to the life of people, the insurgents. So, we, through our radio, we want to tell the people, the citizens, to show the enemy's real face to them, so they don't give them shelter, they don't hide between in their houses and in their areas. When the Taliban were largely exiled from all major cities, they moved to rural areas, small villages where they could operate without foreign influence. Through radio and DJs like Khashal, an Afghan voice can inform and bring the airwaves back to the people. So we tell the people that who the enemy are, what they want, what is their goals. We tell them that the enemies don't want Afghanistan to be an independent country, don't want Afghanistan a pro to pro a progress to take place in Afghanistan and uh, we tell them the truth. Information gathering and dissemination is a tough endeavor. According to General Petraeus, challenging disinformation while acknowledging setbacks serves Afghans well. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and NATO ISAF civilians are turning counterinsurgency theory and guidance into reality daily. Nine years of conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq has forged an educated and experienced military, well-versed in counterinsurgency operations. These strategic captains and sergeants, versatile battlefield leaders, are enabling initiatives and managing programs that have redefined progress and development within Afghanistan. We've never had a military, a professional military, uh, that has been engaged in wars of such duration. Uh, but virtually any of our commissioned warrant and non-commissioned officers on the ground now have had at least one tour in Iraq or Afghanistan, and many have had multiple full-year tours, in some cases the surge tours, uh, which were 15 months. So there's an extraordinary reservoir of experience and expertise. Uh, I see enormous versatility, initiative, innovativeness, uh, just sheer understanding of the complexities of these kinds of operations and also extraordinary courage. We need to maneuver on them or we need somebody else to maneuver on them. We have them pinned down to the south. They're going to attend that little The impact of all the programs and initiatives aimed at bringing security, development, and governance to the people may not be readily seen, but the road to improvement is paved with credible optimism.
It's hard sometimes to quantify when you're doing the coin and KLEs how much you impact versus how much you don't. And I think uh, the impacts are, will be well deserved over the years, uh, especially when we're dealing and we make a lot of good friends with these Afghans and see improvements. And it's really important to see that uh, the success of Afghanistan, uh, because you come here and you take, take time away from your family, uh, but it's also uh, important to see how you develop the families here and bring their villages along uh, and also uh, remove uh, enemy insurgents that are willing to thwart and hurt uh, ourselves as well as them. You are proud of a soft soldier yes. to help our country. Making progress in an Afghan counterinsurgency requires the ability to wear many hats and perform many roles. A strategic captain, sergeant, and their team must be cognizant of local circumstances and situations. This level of warfare, often called the graduate level, is highly complex. Learning and adapting to the conditions is a way of life for these professionals. The, the IEDs and the mines that are all in the roads here it, it just goes to show how the, the Taliban don't care about the people. Uh, they don't care about you, they don't care about us, they only care about them. We often talk about the leaders having to be pentathlete leaders. Uh, in other words, they can, they can do offense, they can do defense, they can also sit and drink tea uh, in a key leader engagement. They can oversee uh, reconstruction of, of areas that have been damaged, revive markets, and then go out that night on a an intelligence-driven raid and kill or capture uh, a serious Taliban leader. Essential mission skills in Afghanistan also include farming, raising livestock, and cultivating natural resources. National Guardsmen from 12 states, agribusiness development teams, deploy on year-long tours to help Afghans attain a functional level of prosperity and self-sustainability through improved agricultural methods. Mentoring Afghan farmers is like a step back in time when electricity and technology was non-existent. But the techniques employed by the agribusiness teams are anything but ancient. Well, the mission is to work with the government officials and Afghan farmers, providing them technical advice, and planning for their future so that they can be more productive in their agriculture. Right now, most Afghan farmers are in a sustainment mode. They're producing barely enough to eat. So if we can improve their production just a little bit, they have enough to eat and enough to sell on their market, and that improves their lifestyle. As you both, you and I both know, that's where the real money came. These are the faces of progress. Strategic captains, sergeants, agribusiness teams, flexibility and skills for the benefit of a safer, prosperous new Afghanistan. What must U.S. and coalition forces do in the next year to maintain and build upon the gains made? The answer lays with the pillars of an effective counterinsurgency. What we have to do, obviously, is to expand the security bubbles uh, that we have fought hard to establish in certain locations. Uh, within those bubbles, to build on the security foundation by uh, helping our Afghan partners establish good local governance that achieves legitimacy in the eyes of the people because it serves them in an inclusive and transparent manner. Uh, help again revive local economies, help farmers plant licit crops rather than, than the poppy, let's say, so that Afghan people can see uh, that this approach can improve their lives uh, in the future will provide a brighter prospect for them and for their children and therefore deserves their support. Support for security forces, local and national governments and continued development provides a framework for a sustainable progress and hope. The rest is up to the future of Afghanistan, their education, their goals and their dreams. My name is Anita, my father and my General Petraeus says much progress has been made, but there's still plenty of work to be done. The hope is that this counterinsurgency is the way forward for Afghanistan. Thanks for watching.